Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tate. Hello everyone, welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me. I'm Dr. Abby Ross, physical therapist, treating vestibular dysfunction as well as neurologic clinical specialist. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Dr. Danielle Tate, also a physical therapist treating vestibular dysfunction. Hello, and we are so excited to have our first guest here on Talk Dizzy to Me. It is my pleasure to introduce a fellow vestibuloholic physical therapist, as well as my friend and colleague, Dr. Kelly Keener. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you both so much for having me. I'm really excited for our conversations today. Thank so you for we. joining us. <laughs> um, so Abby, Kelly and I became friends through also kind of another turn of fate, similar to you and me. Um, <laughs> we both attended Misericordia University up in Dallas, Pennsylvania, but she was just coming up to PT school when I was getting ready to get out. But we actually first met when we were working with a family as private caregivers, and oh. it was close to our school. They used PT um, uh, students to kind of work with their family members that needed their care. So we kind of connected through there. And um, I actually ended up leaving to go on my last couple of clinical rotations, which included a rotation with Jeff Walter up at the Otolaryngology Vestibular and Balance Center at Geisinger Medical up in Danville, Pennsylvania. And this is where I became a full-fledged vestibuloholic. I was obsessed. We saw dizzy patients all day, every day for 10 weeks. It was amazing. So a few years later, um, Kelly actually landed the same clinical rotation after taking his continuing ed course that he teaches at Misericordia. So she reached out and kind of said, you know, what should I expect? Um, any advice for me? And we kind of, you know, kept in touch that way. But then both Kelly and I, as well as our neurology professor, Christina Dorkowski, attended the vestibular competency course at Emory University. And we had no oh, idea yeah. that Kelly was going to be there. We kind of just ran into, into each other in the lobby because I think they forgot to get your room ready or something. Yes. Oh, and, my gosh, uh, I was forever. It was <laughs> terrible. But uh, we yes. ended up really connecting and bonding that whole week. So mm -hmm. after that, both Christina and Kelly joined me with vestibular today and obsessing over it. Um, and I'm really, really happy she agreed to come on and talk Dizzy to me because I'm really excited about the topic that you chose. Um, why don't you fill us in about why you picked uh, the horizontal canal and BPV and, and why? Yes. Okay. And I also just feel a need to add in. So in order to take Jeff's clinical rotation, so to be eligible for it, you have to also take his vestibular elective course. And so during the course, he always shows a lot of different like case study videos. And many of them were recorded back when Danielle was a student at the Balance Center. So I remember sitting in class taking his course and he always prefaces the videos that Danny's in by saying, and this is my best vestibular student of all time, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> so like I would, I would sit there in class and just be like, oh my goodness, no pressure or anything. That's a <laughs> title to hold. Now, so. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to talk about horizontal canal BPPV because truthfully, I hated it. When I first started out as a student, this was like the hardest thing for me to get a hold of. And being at the balance center the first week is really intense because you're getting acclimated to a new environment and it's not like your typical outpatient experience that you'd expect at all. Like you have to learn all these new treatment maneuvers and all this different terminology. And the terminology is what would really get me with the horizontal canal. It's like apogeotropic, geotropic, like what does any of this mean? Mm -hmm. And so as a student, you have to create goals like every so many weeks. So it was only the first probably week and I was talking with Jeff and I was like, ah, I really don't like horizontal canal BPPV. Like, I'm not good at it. It's hard for me to understand. And he just goes, well, that's too bad because you're going to see it a lot when you're here. And I was like, <laughs> I'm doomed. I'm like, this is the end. So um, after hearing that, I remember I was driving home and I'm like, I have to just study this all the time until I get it. And that's exactly what I did. I'd go home after clinical and then just read and study until I went to bed at night. And this was at the time, I think vestibular today was relatively newer, but I remember that Danny had started vestibular today. So I just went on and I was searching through the blogs and she has a blog um, about the bow and lean test. And so we're also going to link that just in case anyone happens to feel the same way that I do about <laughs> horizontal canal. Hopefully you can read through this blog and it will help you as well. So I was reading through that blog and that was like my light bulb moment. It was like everything that I had been studying prior and then reading through that, I was like, oh. It's like, I get this now. So 
it helps me, helped me connect the dots. And then I went on to see it a lot in clinic, like Jeff said I would. And by the time the clinical was almost over, I was independent with the evaluations. And I remember one experience in particular, it was just me and there was a medical student in the room with me. And we were going through this evaluation and it really seemed like it was going to be straightforward BPPV. There wasn't really any odd findings like during the subjective section, everything seemed to be checking out okay. And then the rest of the evaluation was looking good. And we got to the positioning test section. And sure enough, this patient presents with geotropic nystagmus bilaterally, worse on the right side. Patient agrees that it's worse on the right side. So did a Gaffoni maneuver, cleared the VPPV. Patient was thrilled. I was thrilled because it was the first time I did it, <laughs> even though I won't say that. <laughs> and then the med student turned to me and she's like, how did you know how to do that? And um, the patient just said, she's like, I'm not sure, but I'm glad she knew how. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> so it was like full circle moment for me. That's awesome. Yes. So interestingly, horizontal involvement is more rare than our ever so common posterior involvement. But in a clinic where you're seeing all vestibular patients all day, mm -hmm. every day, you do tend to get more than the average, right? Yes. So, and Yes. And Danny ahead. and I were actually speaking about this recently too, just about, so technically uh, horizontal canal BPPV is not as common. You don't see it as much in the clinic, but it also has a higher rate of spontaneous recovery or the patient just fixes it themselves unknowingly, like if they're rolling over in bed. So we were just mentioning how it, like it might be more prevalent, but we just yeah. don't see it as much too. So yeah, yeah, that's such a good point. They don't have to come to us because they fix it on them on their own without even knowing. Yes. Yeah, and all the prevalence studies are based around patients that come into the clinic, right? So mm -hmm. they're looking at prevalence of the patients that come in and present with identifiable identifiable BPPV, and. A lot of times, I'm sure you guys have seen this too, you'll have a patient come in and say, a couple weeks ago, I turned over in bed and the room started spinning. So I quickly turned back on the other side. I haven't had a problem since, but it scared me. And like, what was that? You know, so it, they did have, it sounds like a horizontal canal issue, but just doing that quick roll back in bed, they spontaneously fixed themselves. And mm -hmm. it makes you wonder how many patients actually have this experience. And it's probably a lot larger than we realize because by the time they reach a clinician or they, they reach these vestibular clinics, you know, it could have cleared up on its own. So really it could be a lot more common than we think, but it's just not identifiable, identifiable by the time they get into the clinic. So it's, right. it's kind of weird to think about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Very good Definitely. point though. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about what we'll hear as a clinician in the history for a patient who has horizontal canal BPPV. Yeah. So with this, you really don't have to overcomplicate it. You're going to approach it the same way that you would any other vestibular evaluation. You want to find what is provoking the patient's dizziness. And most of the time, it's going to be positional changes um, with no matter what kind of BPPD you're dealing with. So typically, the patient's going to be dizzy. They'll complain of positional type dizziness or vertigo for several seconds, maybe up to a minute. It's usually going to be triggered by a change in head position. You don't have to look too much into it and think like, try to, you don't have to try to figure out which canal you think is affected just based on the subjective questioning. Because once you get to positioning tests, it's going to tell you right there. So, mm -hmm. Good. So off the cuff question here, lately, as I treat patients virtually, I've been asking actually more specifics on what they're seeing when they feel the vertigo. For example, does whatever object they're looking at does it seem to shift more side to side or does it seem to have a true spinning component to it? Because that does kind of help clue me in then as to what I'm thinking when I, when it comes to which canal is involved. I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but when I started treating virtually, I noticed I asked more of that type of question too. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. I actually have a really good uh, video clip on one of the goggle reviews that I shared of a woman, she's lying back on the table and she's doing this because she's saying she's spinning. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can ask a patient if they're on a Ferris wheel or a merry-go-round and they'll tell you they're either spinning head, you know, head over feet or the room's going around in a circle. So it's, it's interesting that you can maybe guess the canal that they're having an issue with just based on what they would perceive their spinning direction to be. Yeah. Right. And Right. Those, those leading questions are really important, though, because patients have such a hard time describing dizziness. And quite frankly, they probably don't care too much either because it's just like, I'm dizzy. So when you try to break it down for them, sometimes it's a little frustrating for the patient, too, because they're just like, 
I'm not sure I'm just dizzy. <laughs> so it right. does help to ask. I think and it's again, a good point that. to put in too that um, sometimes with horizontal canal, I find that these patients are severely more symptomatic than a posterior mm-hmm. canal involved patient. So these are the patients that sometimes end up going to the hospital immediately because they think they're having a stroke or they can't get up out of bed right away just because they're so dizzy and they have these symptoms. No matter which way they turn, they end up just laying down in bed and not moving for a bit. Um, I have a lot of yeah. patients that vomit too when they have horizontal canal. I was canal just involved. gonna say that yes. these are the patients I say, okay, let's make sure we have something handy just in case. If you're treating any sort of vestibular patients, any sort of uh, group of these patients is absolutely worth the $20 investment in a sleeve of Emesis bags off of Amazon. <laughs> you will not go through them very quickly, but when you need them, they are gold. Like I, yes. It is definitely good to have on hand. We actually used to tape them underneath the treatment tables at my last job. Oh, that way we could funny. rip them off for an emergency, uh, an emergency patient <laughs> just in case. Yes, that is convenient. <laughs> I'll also add in that virtually I have had a patient vomit and it's very different dealing with a patient right next to them, helping them through it versus talking them through it virtually. It's a whole different experience, but nonetheless, let's say the preliminary exam is unremarkable, pretty normal, and we're moving on to more of the BPPV assessment. What specific tests then are we looking at for horizontal canal involvement? Okay. Why don't we preface this going into um, with what we're looking for first with horizontal canal. So assume the Dix Hall pikes are negative and we're looking at horizontal canal involvement. Remembering Ewald's laws, the, the first law being um, the direction of nystagmus is going to be directly correlated to the canal that's being stimulated. So if we have a horizontal canal involvement, we are going to see pure horizontal nystagmus, mm-hmm. right? Um, but the horizontal canal gets different names applied to the nystagmus, depending on the direction of movement in relationship to the ground. Um, mm-hmm. If you, you don't want to use left or right beating nystagmus, because it's going to change uh, depending on what position you're in. So with horizontal canal, canalithiasis, these are free-floating debris in the, in the canals. We are looking for what we call geotropic nystagmus. So this is where the fast phase is beating towards the earth. Um, We typically want to see it to be transient, so it's going to stop at some point. Um, And you can pretty much figure out why it's supposed to be beating towards the earth, depending on um, what direction those crystals are moving and how it excites the canals. If you think about nystagmus, nystagmus always beats to the more neurally active ear. Mm -hmm. So if those crystals are moving towards the the cupular, towards the ampulla in the canal, when you lay the patient down with their involved ear down, those crystals, if they're in that canal, should be moving towards the cupula, causing excitatory response and creating that ear to be more neurally active, creating an astagmus beating towards the ground. When you flip them to the other side, to the uninvolved ear, those crystals then move away from the cupula, away from the ampulla. This inhibits the canal, which technically makes that uninvolved side more neurally active because you're inappropriately inhibiting the other lateral canal. So when you turn them to the opposite side, you're going to see a probably more faint um, nystagmus beating towards that uninvolved side just because it's technically more neurally active. So for horizontal canal, canal of eyes, to sum it up, we are looking for transient, so uh, not longer than a minute, nystagmus beating towards the earth no matter which side you turn the head. All right, so now let's jump into positional testing. All right. Good. So we're going to talk about three in particular. First is the sit to supine test, which is, I kind of learned about this fairly recently, but it's a good little thing to make note of, and it will really help you during your evaluation. So sit to supine test, roll test, and then the bow and lean test. So bear with me for the sit to supine test. So with this test, you're just going to have the patient start out in a long sitting position, and then you're lying them back into supine. And you just want to make sure that you have a little bit, the 30 degrees of cervical flexion. And when you lie the patient back, if you're suspecting horizontal canal BPPV, just quickly observe what type of nystagmus you see in this position, because it will help you later on throughout your evaluation. So with this, when you lie a patient down on their back and say, if you see right or right um, horizontal nystagmus, write that down because it could help you out later on. So when you bring them down to supine, it's going to beat to the uninvolved side if the nystagmus is geotropic later and towards the affected side if it's apogeotropic. So we'll talk about this a little bit more 
later when we talk about the bow and lean test too, because this test is very similar to the response that you'd get from the lean portion of a bow and lean test. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So with the roll test, this is basically your gold standard for positioning tests for the horizontal canal. So you're starting patient off in supine and you want to maintain that 30 degrees of cervical spine flexion just to ensure that your horizontal canal is earth vertical and you're getting the response that you're looking for. And so then you're going to turn the patient's head to the right side, observe for any type of nystagmus, and then to the left side or left, right. It doesn't matter which side you go to first. But with this test, though, you want to make sure that the patient has at least 60 degrees of cervical spine rotation, um, because if they don't, you're going to have to really assist them with this to make sure that you're eliciting the response that you want. So say if a patient has less than 60 degrees, you're really going to have to log roll them onto their side and then just watch for any type of nystagmus with that. So if you do get a response with this test, you want to get excited because now you have BPPV, horizontal canal <laughs> BPPV, and you're going to be treating it. So you get excited. Your patient, maybe not so much. <laughs> no, they're rarely <laughs> excited. It's usually like, you're crazy. <laughs> so yes, but all right. So next one too, that we want to talk about is the bow and lean test. So this is another really important test um, to know because a lot of times, like we speak about earlier, with the horizontal canal, patients are very symptomatic and they get they get sick to their stomachs with this. So you don't want to keep flipping them from side to side with the roll test until you figure out, oh, I think it's the right side. Save yourself some time, save your, save your patient some misery and do the bow and lean test because this one really does give you a good um, response and it could really help. Sometimes I've heard that sometimes people don't get it all the time. They don't get the response that they're looking for. But if you do, this is really helpful. So... Mm -hmm. With the bow and lean test, the patient is just going to start in the seated position, and then you want to have them, um, you typically you'll lean forward first, so you want to have them flex the cervical spine that 30 degrees, and then you're going to forward lean the trunk about 60 degrees more, just so then you get that cupula perpendicular with gravity. And so when you uh, lean the body forward, what you're looking for is, if, if the, during the roll test, if you saw geotropic nystagmus, when you lean your patient forward, you should see nystagmus now that beats to the affected side if you're dealing with canalithiasis. So then you'll typically hold that forward lean position for about one to two minutes or at least until you get the response that you're looking for. And then you can go back into the, oh, the, the lean the portion. Lean. So yeah, you're in the bow. Sorry, I said that wrong. You're forward in the bow and then you're going to go back into the lean portion. And so the lean portion is going to be exactly the opposite. So if you had geotropic nystagmus and now the patient is leaning back, you're going to get nystagmus that beats toward the unaffected side. And then you'll get, if it's um, cupulolithiasis, you'll get nystagmus that beats toward the affected side. So, Dr. So uh, Rick and Daniel, I took one of his courses up in Connecticut and he used a little, a little saying, he said, up with a cup. So if you, yes, up, if you wanted to determine say. side, yeah, if you wanted to determine side for cupulothiasis, you just put them into the lean. The lean will give you the affected side for cupulothiasis and the mm -hmm. bowel gives you the affected side for um, uh, canalithiasis. Cupulo yes. for that back. That little thing used to forward. save me when I was first learning. I could never remember, okay, and bowel is the affected side canalithiasis or cupulothiasis. And then I would say, cup up, up cup, cup up. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, but it, helps. it really it does get helps. confusing. So like to, as you're going through it, so that really does help. And yeah, so the lean portion, like we were talking about earlier, that that's going to give you the similar response that you would get with that sit long sit to supine test. So just little things to make notes of as you're going through your evaluation and these things really do help. So, and then I just want to add here, you know, sometimes depending on, if you're seeing a patient in clinic or virtually, as we treat that balancing act, virtually I find the roll test to be so much easier just having the patient roll because I don't have my hands on their head to guide how far the a rotation I want. So I just have them log roll, call it a day. Yeah. But um, moving on, Kelly, what would you say is your go-to maneuver for treating horizontal canal BPPV? For both so, canalithiasis and for cupulolithiasis. For canalithiasis, I'm using the Gaffoni maneuver. It's just, it, it works. And it's, I find it to be the most friendly position, so to say. So like people who have cervical spine pain, 
it's just the easiest position to get them in. And the other benefit of this is that you're lying the patient on their uninvolved side. So I find that you could do repeated, if you need to, you could do repeated Gaffoni maneuvers kind of over and over again until um, you fix it. And so I don't want to jinx it by saying it, but I'm going to say it. Every time I've used the Gaffoni maneuver, it's worked. <laughs> so I have not shied away from that because it's, it's been so successful for me. And then with cubulolithiasis, and I think I'm going to speak this into existence right now, but I have not had to treat that yet. <laughs> um, what? While, yes, while practicing on my own. So I, I started practicing February 2019. And so I've been in a bit of a drought with that, but I feel like I'm going to speak <laughs> it into existence. Um, but I would use the Kim maneuver for cubulolithiasis. And if that's not successful, there's other maneuvers that you can go into too. Like you could do a prolonged positioning um, or you could try the Gaffoni for apogeotropic nystagmus and see if that helps. Um, but first and, what's and the foremost, difference for, for uh, cupulolithiasis in that maneuver? So for the Gaffoni maneuver for cupulolithiasis, you're lying on the involved side instead of the uninvolved side. And when you're on the involved side, you're turning the head up towards the ceiling instead of down towards the floor mm -hmm. so, or mm -hmm. down towards the mat table, whichever. So, but yep. basically, if you can't get it with the Kim maneuver, try anything possible to just get those, get the debris detached from the otoconia. So then you get the crystals moving because if you could get it into the canal, you could fix it. So that's really mm -hmm. what you're trying for, whatever your approach is at that point. Even so, sometimes just straight vigorous rolling, if you're having a hard yes. time treating it, having the patient roll really hard each way can help dislodge the otoconia. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different type of maneuvers for the horizontal canal, it seems. There's every Italian name known to man, yes. um, whether it's Cassani, whether it's Guffoni, Venucci, Asparella, there's there's a bunch Apiani. of different, different ways. Yeah, Appiani. There's a and it's it's very interesting. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to effectively treat that. There was a, a poster study that I actually came across not too long ago from a clinician in Greece that compared the effectiveness of, I believe, the Gufoni, the barbecue roll, and the Venucci Asparella. And they all had the same amount of effect and effectiveness mm -hmm. with patients. I guess it just depends on what you're comfortable using as a clinician and what your patients are comfortable with. Like if I have somebody that has a lot of cervical spine pain, the Gufoni, or it's also referred to as Appiani, where you lay down to the uninvolved side and turn the head into the table and then sit back up. That seems to be a little bit easier, especially if there's any low back issues. The barbecue roll, you got to make sure the patient's got the range of motion. They've got the, they've got the ability to kind of move around like that and they're comfortable with it. Um, for cubulolithiasis, I've used the Kim maneuver, but that also comes with um, some cautionary uh, advice as well, um, which is the Kim maneuver is, is just basically a um, barbecue roll, but you vibrate in very specific positions to help dislodge otoconia from the cupula if it's stuck. And, you know, if you have somebody that's very prone to BPBV, you want to be very cautious about vibrating their skull and shaking anything else loose in there that could displace more crystals and make them more symptomatic. So um, that's usually not the, the first go-to, but I have used it and have had some success with converting it, which has been great. But Abby, I know you use something a little bit differently that I'm interested in. So why don't you tell us about what you use for cupula lithiasis? Yeah. So, you know, it the way you treat really depends on how you were trained one and then what you're good at two and then three, <laughs> what you've had success with. So yes. just anecdotally treating patients in the clinic and actually virtually uh, for cupulolithiasis, I usually go straight to the Cassani maneuver, which is where you uh, have a patient go on the affected side and then immediately they turn their head down to the floor. So it's bang, bang. It's a quick maneuver the first part to dislodge the otoconia, the second part to facilitate them moving to where they belong. In terms of canal thiasis, I honestly have done more barbecue roll than I have Gufoni, but um, again, just what I was used to doing in the clinic and explaining it, teaching it. Um, but Gufoni, I will use every now and then if, I, if I'm unsuccessful or like you said, if a patient's less mobile or, you know, where I'm worried about all the directions in the barbecue roll, making sure they don't roll back into the reverse direction, for example, which I'm sure we've all had a patient do that before, especially if you're just, yes. if you're just verbally describing the maneuver and your, your hands oh, are not Lord. physically on the patient. 
No, roll to your right, right, right. No, that's your left. <laughs> the other right. <laughs> your other right, yes. Um, so, yeah, I think it really just depends on what you're good at. And the beauty about BPPV is you try one maneuver, it's not giving you the results you need. You've got another one to go after. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, so here's another, another thing that um, I think is worth talking about is um, canal conversions. So do you guys retest on the same day that you treat patients? I do. Usually. What, what's your experience it, been with that? Have you ever converted somebody? Yeah, I have. And then <laughs> usually, <laughs> so I see the horizontal nystagmus and I think to myself, I'm like, oh, darn it. I know what I did. And then I'm just like, I play it off cool though. I usually just tell the patient, I'm like, well, we just have to do another, a different treatment maneuver this time. That's all. We're going to go through it. Just do a different treatment maneuver. This one usually works good. And they usually end up leaving happy. They, um, I haven't really experienced, uh, too many issues with that other than just the, oh my goodness, we have to do another treatment maneuver, but yeah, it, it has happened, but I That's still usually happen. That's usually happening after you treat for a posterior canal issue, right? So you treat for yes. posterior canal, they usually sit for a couple minutes and then you go to retest. And sometimes when you retest, you kind of warn the patient, you're either going to be fine because nothing's going to you know, happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, you might feel the same symptoms that you just had because we could be putting crystals back in the canal or they could still be there. Or you could potentially feel a little bit worse for a little Some bit, but worse. we can fix that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I fix that. <laughs> I will say when I'm treating in the clinic, I, I have just had terrible luck. I don't like to retest patients same day because I have converted them. There was like a, a slew of patients that were maybe only supposed to come in for that day because they were going out of town. I'm like, let's retest you before you go. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, like three out of three, I converted to, to horizontal canal. I'm like, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> you got the so, magic touch there. <laughs> uh, so what I typically do now is I won't retest same day. I bring them back a couple of days later just to retest. And I, I hammer home some more education mm -hmm. on how to perform the maneuvers at home, what exactly was going on. Because they first come in, sometimes they're really overwhelmed with the explanation mm -hmm. of why their vertigo is occurring. Yes. So a lot of stuff just goes over their head. Um, so I personally don't retest, but I do think sometimes it's really great to be able to do that for patients to kind of show them that when they go home, they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Now I have a piggyback question off of this. So when you say retest, are you simply putting them into Dick's Hall Pike and roll test positions? Yes. yes. Okay. So, yeah. Say if you, we'll, we'll stick with horizontal canal. So say if you just did a gaffoni with a patient, just have them sit back up, give them a few minutes and then go back down and uh, retest it. If somebody has horizontal canal, I'm definitely retesting it. H horizontal canal. Let me back up. If somebody has horizontal canal canalithiasis, mm -hmm. definitely going to retest it because with the gaffoni, you're lying on your uninvolved side. So just keep doing as many as you need to with that. Um, so but, that's what I was going to say. I don't, I don't, retest per se. I don't put them into Dick's Hall Pike and roll test, but I will retreat. So if I, if the, the patient can tolerate it, I'll do multiple maneuvers, uh, within the same session again to their tolerance, but I don't, I don't, uh, put them into Dick's Hall Pike and, and roll test again. I'll wait till the next session to formally reassess. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, with performing a gufoni again, lying them down to the uninvolved side, you're not putting the opening of that canal um, in you know, line with gravity with these crystals to be able to, to be pulled back in. You're retesting them so that there really isn't going to be any sort of conversion or um, re-entering of those otoconia into the canal. So that's, you know, that's a really good point to just do another gufoni and see if they're negative. Mm -hmm. um, and then same thing with the epilies. I mean, if you're comfortable doing multiple epilies, um, you, you can still run the risk of doing a conversion, which I've done probably just because of positioning purposes. But um, that's a good point, especially like if they don't want to come back or they're not anticipating coming back, you know, retesting to make you feel like you've got everything is a, definitely a good way to make sure that you feel confident you've had a successful treatment. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so um, one other thing, too, I wanted to talk about, though, is just like with regard to uh, conversion from posterior canal to horizontal canal. So. I recently found out, um, so this is a little, it's a little bit off topic, but with, um, when you're doing Epley versus Samant maneuver. So this is helpful to keep in mind. So, um, we're going to link the study for this, but there was a comparative study that compared the, um, the rate of 
basically like the likelihood of converting when you do an Epley maneuver versus a Samant maneuver, converting to horizontal canal BPPV. And so the rate for patients who received an Epley maneuver, 7.8% of them converted from posterior to horizontal canal upon retesting. And then with the Samant maneuver, no patients did. It was zero. Hmm. So this is just something to keep in mind. So like we all have our little clan of patients who are, they'll call us if their crystals are loose and they know to come back. So if you have one that you know has um, converted in the past, it might be good to make note like, okay, maybe we should try the Samant maneuver this time around so then we can avoid that if the patient can tolerate it. Because I know sometimes people shy away from the Samant maneuver because it is kind of hard to get people in those different positions. But if it works and that's something, if it, if it could help the patient, it's good to know that. So. Yeah. yeah thank really you for that. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just learned something new. I didn't know that. <laughs> do you know, do you happen to know off the top of your head, how big the sample size was? I think with, it was out of 54 patients. Okay. What do you, not yes. bad. Yeah. There, it was quite a bit. So. That's awesome. Still good to know. Um, yeah. So if you guys are up for it, I actually had a really interesting horizontal canal BPPV patient last week um, with a lot of interesting stuff in her video that maybe we could just kind of break down. Um, it's a it's a good example of patients don't always present like they do in the textbook, um, especially with a lot of funky things going on in this video. I mean, I had to actually consult with Jeff Walter about this to see if he knew exactly what was going on. I was comfortable in my treatment and we, we got the patient, you know, uh, cleared up, but I was kind of like, what the heck happened? And he's like, I know exactly what happened. Let me tell you. And it was like light bulb moment after light bulb moment after hearing him kind of break things down. So I was wondering if I could share that with you guys, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So let me. I'm not going to lie. When I first saw this video, I was like, whoa, (laughs) (laughs) this poor patient. Wait a second. All right. So just a little bit background. I actually treated her a couple of months ago for BPBV. Um, it was horizontal canal. We cleared it up in one visit. It was fine. She's had symptoms wax and wane over many years. So she called me back up and she said, it's back. I feel terrible. Can I come see you? So sure enough, she comes in. Same exact history. Um, it sounded like it was run of the, like run of the mill thing that we were looking at before. Um, it was all transient vertigo related to positional changes. All bedside testing was normal. And right before I start this video, I had just done a left Dix Hall pike. And it was negative. It was clear. So let's get this rolling. And I have the patient turn her head to the right. She's going to lie down flat. I'm, I'm attempting a right Dix Hall pike, but you'll notice perfectly horizontal geotropic nystagmus. Yes. So I know it's horizontal canal. So I lift her head up into 30 degrees of cervical flexion. I'm not even going to waste my time with the posterior canal test in the Dix Hall pike. We clearly have a horizontal canal issue. Mm -hmm. So um, after I get her into this position, we've got pretty strong nystagmus. Um, It's slowing down. It actually took a long time for it to slow down, Um, a lot longer than I've typically seen in horizontal canal canalithiasis. Uh, She definitely felt very symptomatic and... um, the indication that it stopped and it slowed down to me just confirms that this is transient. It is canalithiasis. So now we want to do a roll test of the other side to make sure we can get an idea of which side's worse, which side we need to treat. Um, she told me that she thought it was her left side. So I turned her head to the left and I got nothing. Uh, nothing was really going on here. I was maybe having some faint geotropic nystagmus, as you can see here. Yeah, a little bit yeah, it's very faint, but you would not expect for someone who, who told me that she felt worse lying on her left side that this would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, okay, that's kind of strange. Um, from there, I went back to the right because I'm like, all right, let's 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 see if we can replicate this. I want to try to replicate the symptoms side to side, right? I want to get geotropic. Well, now I turn her to the right and we've got some apogeotropic. Now we are going the complete opposite direction. It's not crescendoing and decrescendoing, uh, decrescendoing like you would see with a typical canalithiasis. And I'm like, oh, crap. So, you know, if I pause it here, if we just look at what we just saw, you might think, okay, this is clearly a right horizontal canal, BPBB, canalithiasis issue, but maybe she's got cupulothiasis too, because now we're seeing 
apogeotropic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not happy with that. So I, I want to see if I can play around <laughs> with it a little bit first so I can I can see if I can get this to behave the way I want it to behave. So I turn her to the left, and I've seen this sometimes. Patients have differing anatomy at times. So once I do get her turned to the left, I actually drop her head back a little bit because I noticed that we saw, oh, 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 oh no. <laughs> Uh, oh, there, there it is. Um, we actually saw uh, that she had really strong nystagmus when I had her head extended a little bit better. So I drop her head back a little bit and boom, out of the blue, I'm able to get that strong geotropic nystagmus back. Like, oh, so strong. That's she the money right trooper. there. Trooper. <laughs> yeah. And she was, oh, she's so great. She's fantastic. And clearly this is a lot stronger than it was on the right. So the patient nailed it on the head from the start. She, you know, mm-hmm. it was a left side involvement. I was able to replicate the nystagmus. I felt better about it, um, but I did want to just make sure I justified what side that we were treating. Mm -hmm. Uh, So eventually I do get her into, well, another thing we need to know here though, is I waited for the nystagmus to stop. And then I had a little bit of, I had, I was like a little bit of, oh my gosh, what the heck is this? So once her nystagmus stops, she's still in a head left position. We've got some pretty strong apogeotropic nystagmus. I had an idea of what this was, yeah. but uh, typically this is a lot stronger than you would typically would, than you would see with these patients. So sometimes there's something called central nervous system compensation. So this is the brain's way of trying to stop this strong burst of nystagmus. It tries to create nystagmus in the opposite direction. It just usually shows up to the party late. So for her, she had the strong reaction in the left roll. We got the geotropic nystagmus, and now we have this central nervous system compensation, which could have been what we were seeing when I had her in the right roll with the apogeotropic on the other mm-hmm. side. So with the bow and lean, I typically just cut it to just the bow for canalithiasis. I don't need to make her dizzy and hold the positions. Once I get her into a bow, I want to see which direction the nystagmus beats to to indicate the ear that we need to treat. And then I set them up and move them on. There's no reason, I, I think, to keep the patient there, keep them symptomatic. She was already okay. symptomatic. You'll see her. She brings her bag up to her face. Oh, but, uh, no. <laughs> we were able to, um, you know, not have any issues there. And we were able to go into our um, treatment maneuver, which we did a um, gufoni for left horizontal canal canalithiasis. It cleared up in one visit. All was good. Awesome. But I did want to go back and kind of walk through the video with Jeff to get his input as to, you know, why did I not get a response initially when I turned her head to the left? And he made a really interesting point. And he says he's he's seen this in his clinic a, a bunch of times, actually, with our, if we have our horizontal canals here, we, if we had a left horizontal canal involvement and all the otoconia were in the posterior aspect of that arm, I did a left Dix Hall pike first. So I had her head turned to the involved side and I had her lie back. I pinned the otoconia mm-hmm. to the back portion of the posterior arm of the horizontal canal. So when I sat her up and I turned her head to the right and I had her go into a right Dix Hall pike, I was scooting all of those otoconia out of the left horizontal canal back into the utricle, effectively fixing her beep and BV. So we had that strong burst because we had all this otoconia leaving. We had a good reaction. That was, she was fixed accidentally on her first, you know, um, uh, right Dick's Hall pike and into her role. So when I turned her back to the left, I didn't get a response because I had just fixed the problem on the left side and I didn't you know, put the crystals back in. So if the canal was clear, we turn it to left, we don't see anything. But I think I saw um, that faint geotropic nystagmus because it was a central nervous system compensation after having such a strong burst of nystagmus on the right side. Mm -hmm. So in the right role, if you're talking left and right, she's going to have a right beating nystagmus, which is her geotropic. So by the time the nystagmus stopped and I just put her into a left role, she had a faint geotropic nystagmus just because it was beating in the opposite direction of what we just caused on the other Mm. side. So then I brought her back to the right. And again, we were just still seeing that central nervous system compensation. We had that apogeotropic and I'm like, what the heck is going on? (laughs) Bring her back to the left. And the reason why I got the big burst of geotropic nystagmus is because I just re-entered all those otoconia. I cleared out of the canal, back into the canal. Oh, yes. So we fixed her and then we uh, made it recur again. And then we fixed her again. But after kind of putting her through her paces, and thank goodness she was a very tolerant patient. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, I, it, as a clinician, I felt better 
knowing that I could replicate everything that was going on. I didn't have any other worries in the back of my head now that I was able to kind of adjust the patient and, and see what I would expect to see to respond as, as BPBV BPB, BPB should. Yes. So yes, I know the patient probably suffered a little bit more in that moment, but it made me feel a lot more confident that we were successful in our treatment, that we had the right diagnosis, and I did not go about treating the wrong side for a wrong mm-hmm. condition. It could have been disastrous if I had tried, you know, right Gufonis or right Kim maneuvers for this complex issue. If I didn't actually figure out it was, nope, it was left canal involvement the entire time. The patient was absolutely correct in her assessment that she felt worse, you know, lying on her left, but got it full size rolling side to side. So it's interesting to take everything from you do in the subjective, everything you take in your other bedside testing and apply that to your positional testing and use your insight and knowledge about BBB what you should expect to see and wrap it up all together. It's not as simple as just asking a couple of, of uh, questions and dropping them back into a Dick's Hall Pike. Um, you can get really fine tuned with your testing and with your examination and end up with really good results just in one treatment. Yeah. So it's not all very straightforward, but if you Mm-mm. can work out in your head what exactly is going on, you're going to do a, a really good service for your patient. Yes. And I also think you, you made a good point in this video in that you know, don't be afraid to adjust positions, not, first of all, vestibular disorders in general are not textbook typically, including BPPV. So adjusting positions a little bit, redoing positional testing if you're unclear. And, and I always like to tell the patient too exactly what I'm doing. If, I, if I'm unclear, if I'm uncertain, well, let's just redo this. Let me do it this way. I want to make sure we really figure out exactly where the otoconia are so we know exactly what maneuver to do because the EPLI doesn't solve everything. (laughs) I do a lot of patient education um, even before going into examination just because some patients come in terrified of their Mm -hmm. vertigo and, and becoming symptomatic and I have to warn them it's a good thing if we make you symptomatic. It means that you have what I think you have and we can fix that today hopefully and then I have a little, you. yeah, yes. I have a little PowerPoint presentation. It's like four slides. It just basically says what it is. It has a picture of the organ that I explain where the crystals are and what they do. A, a, a goggle video of what nystagmus looks like. And then I walk them through how a maneuver works with my little model and the rings. And usually you see a light bulb moment go on and I tell them, okay, when you first lay back, you're going to get dizzy. And you might get dizzy in this third position because that's a really good sign. Those crystals are moving out of it now, which means we got it. So we want to be dizzy there. They'll and be like, they, I feel it. And you're like, good, good. Yeah, yeah they get, they get like, into it. I finally got them to cheer with me when I start to see nystagmus. They, they know that if they if they get really dizzy when I lay them back, that there's a chance we can fix it that day. So <laughs> I started off being the only one really excited and cheering when I saw nystagmus. And now I've got patients cheering along now, too, just because they they understand what's going on. I think getting them on board is a big help when going through treatments. So That's funny. Yes. Um, as we wrap up here today, I also just wanted to touch a little bit more on telehealth and BPPV, yes. especially during COVID times, whether you're immunocompromised or just uncomfortable going to a clinic, BPPV actually can be treated virtually. It is more challenging, of course, because our hands are not directly on a patient's head, but it is it is doable. And the analogy that I give is how many times has a patient walked into your clinic and said, well, I saw this video on YouTube Mm -hmm. and maybe it was a really good video. Maybe it was the one that Danny posted to vestibular (laughs) today and it's good, or maybe it's a not so good video and patients are just following whatever's on the screen, not knowing actually where their otoconia are in their inner ear or even what otoconia are at that Mm -hmm. point. Right. So I always say, if a patient can watch a YouTube video and try to help themselves, then adding my clinical decision-making skills is going to make it even even better, right? If this is a terrible experience to begin with having vertigo, let me make sure that we're choosing the correct maneuver. Let me educate. Let me talk the patient through it rather than just them watching a YouTube video. So all the testing in telehealth is the same. You're still going to do bilateral Dix Hall pikes. You're still going to do roll tests. Uh, you might do it a little bit differently, though. Instead of having the patient's head hang off the end of the bed, I usually don't like it to do it that way. I want their head supported. I'll have them uh, modify it with pillows kind of at the small of their back so that when they lie back, they're still getting that cervical extension, but then their head is resting on the bed. And then as we mentioned before, for roll test, I usually won't just have them turn their head. I'll have them log roll. It just seems to be easier. 
And in terms of actually watching for the nystagmus, it's been easier for the most part to have a second person there, a kid, an adult, a spouse, whoever, just to hold the phone close to the eye so that I can see what type of nystagmus is happening and, you know, coach the patient through as we go. And then together we'll talk about, okay, based on your nystagmus, based on your symptoms, this is where the problem is. This is the maneuver that we'll want to do. And I always talk them through the maneuver first. I haven't actually had to demonstrate the maneuver, although I would be happy to if I felt I needed to, but using your words and verbalizing each step as you go. Sometimes I'll have the patient repeat the step before they actually go through it. Uh, uh, for example, with that, in, in the Epley maneuver, you know, from position one to position two, patients like to pick their head up. Mm -hmm. So before I have them do that step, I'll say, okay, you're going to keep your head glued to the bed. And they'll say, I'm keeping my head glued to the bed. You know, I, I just want to make sure they're That's comprehending. So. It is because yes. it can really mess things up, right? It can. It uh, can. But treating BPPV virtually is definitely doable. It just takes a little bit heightened skill when it comes to instruction. And then really trust from your patient because you are not there to hold their hand through it physically. Yeah, but it, I think yeah. it, it's interesting. When I first met you and you told me you started a vestibular telehealth, you know, uh, uh, company, I'm like, Ooh, I'm not sure how that's really done. Well, okay, whatever. And, um, you know, I really sat on it for a long time and I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And then, you know, we kind of got into talks a little bit and then COVID hit and now everything is telehealth. And after kind of getting some training from you and talking through things and practicing on my own, it was, it was nice. Like I liked being able to help patients quicker. For example, I just actually had it this week on Tuesday a patient called. She was supposed to come in for an eval. It sounded like beep and beep, beep but her husband was violently ill that morning. She couldn't leave the house. Mm -hmm. She's like, can we do a, a telehealth? And I was like, yes, now I feel confident to do this. We can absolutely do that. <laughs> so it was actually perfect. She was set up in her bedroom with a laptop and she we went through her, her subjective. We could uh, screen for red flags. Nothing sounded or looked like it was central related. It sounded purely beep and BV. Her bed was right behind her. So I didn't even need to look at nystagmus. You know, I could kind of get an idea of, of what we were looking at testing wise. And I walked her through Dix Hall Pike, nailed it first try, walked her through a maneuver. She instantly felt better. She felt better enough to take care of her husband the rest of the day. And then mm. she came back into the clinic just for some retesting and education afterwards. And she was like, I couldn't believe it. That was so easy. Why didn't I do this before? I could have done this weeks ago. And it was just more comfortable for the patient and having less anxiety. And now they already have training in their own home, how to right. maneuver, you know, right from the comfort of their bed, instead of trying to figure out how to transition from a PT clinic to their bedroom. So right. it's, it's really interesting and it's actually really great to be able to help patients so quickly. So I mean, telehealth is just so cool. It is so cool. I do and, always recommend to patients if they, if their BPPV recurs to call me so that we can assess and make sure it's recurring in the same place uh, mm -hmm. and requires the same maneuver before they just go off and do it. Although some patients feel comfortable trying first to see if they can help themselves and that's cool. But for the most part, I'll say, just give me a call. We'll reassess via video. No problem. We'll make sure you're doing the right thing and go from there. We'll give you a little refresher. Make sure you're doing all the steps perfectly so that we get it one shot. And Abby, how long typically do you spend like time wise? How long does it take you to go through a telehealth session? Uh, eval, usually I'll block out an hour and a half and I'll spend okay. anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half. I think it can take a little bit longer because there is more instruction. You can't just put a patient into the position. You have to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and then follow-up sessions, I'll block off a good 45 minutes, but I'll treat between 30 and 45 minutes, just depending on what needs to get done. And I also always tell them I'll block off this amount of time. We need it. We need it. If we don't, fine. Yeah. Also, I have to know, do you have patients who do record the nystagmus themselves, like by themselves, like if you're doing a Dix Hall <laughs> Pike or roll testing? Yeah, at, not during session. I haven't had anyone ask to do that or, or try that. But okay. if I didn't elicit anything that session, I'm sure you guys have had this experience in clinic too, but they're saying all the hallmarks of BPPV and then you mm -hmm. test them and they're negative. I'll say, okay, the next time you get this, take out your phone, record your eyes, send me the video or bring the video in, whatever. 
and then we'll go from there. So yeah, they do record it in that sense, but I haven't yeah. had anyone record it in session. What's been funny though is, you know, in person, usually it's just you and the patient, mm -hmm. but at home, sometimes a spouse or a child will be present with the patient and they'll be like, wow, your eyes, because <laughs> yes. they haven't seen it before, or even noticed. They're just used to their, their family members saying, my world is spinning, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, now you know why. Look at her eyes. Yes, exactly. I find that really helps too when the um, family members could see too exactly what they're going through. And then it helps from a patient education standpoint as well. Um, and then the ultimate though, is when you're testing, uh, say the parent or something, and then the child is standing nearby and they're like, I think I have this. <laughs> and then they come back and they're like, oh my goodness, you have it too. So there's the I've had that with, with sisters. I had a, a, a twins come in. This one twin dragged her sister in to get treatment. This poor woman had horrible bilateral B BV. I mean, could not tolerate a treatment session. It was bilateral. Oh, bilateral. oh it was, I felt so bad for her. She's rough. like, it's okay. I just don't lay flat anymore for the last five years. But she forced her sister onto the table. She's like, you try this. And sure enough, both, like she had the same thing. She had bilateral um, canal involvement. She was what? symptomatic too. I'm telling you, it was that wild. That would be the best case study ever. Yeah. Oh my I goodness. Know. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, strange. A funny BPPV story too, as we wrap things up. I was waking up in the middle of the night and I actually ran into a wall in my bedroom. I was just very disoriented and I couldn't really figure out why I was disoriented, but I never had that I remember true, true vertigo. I was teaching a, a student of mine and I was having him practice bilateral dexalpike and roll tests on me with infrared goggles. And he's, I remember he, he said like, um, do you feel it? I'm like, yeah, what's going on right now? No <laughs> I way. ended up having BPPV. I'm a vestibular clinician and I didn't put two and two together that it could possibly be BPPV, which is why I'm so disoriented when I wake up in the middle of the night. That's wild and very I insane. I know. Did you get it? You fixed it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We treated it right then and there. But it was just funny that me as a vestibular therapist didn't yes. even recognize that I had BPPV until I was teaching a student. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, well, I, Kelly, thank you so much for coming yes. on today. This was thank so you much so fun. much. I think that we could cover so many more, more episodes with you, including, you know, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to have you back on to talk about some atypical things that we see with horizontal canal, because we could talk about the difference between canalothiasis, cupulothiasis, and even utriculolithiasis, mm -hmm. as well as what happens if you have um, loose otoconia in the anterior arm of the horizontal canal, and um, just dive more into some of the, the cupulothiasis treatments. So if you're willing to come back, we'd love to have you. Oh, I yes, think that would be fantastic. There's so much to talk about, and it's all fun so <laughs> for us I love it yes it is fun for us so well good but, we're holding you to that and we'll have you back here soon yes thank you again thank you if you're interested in finding us on social media or the web you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources including testing treatment and educational videos blogs continuing education classes and resources including clinic equipment recommendations suggested tests, and BPBV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.